At Children's Miracle Network at Gunderson Health System, every child served has a story of courage and perseverance. These are their stories. My name is Caitlin Franzois, and my son Julian was diagnosed with acute lymphoblastic leukemia, uh, B cell type, and he was diagnosed when he was three years old. Um, he went in Christmas Eve with extremely high white blood cell count, and they determined that he had leukemia, and he started chemotherapy the next day after they um, put him in surgery for a port. He got numerous um, red blood cell transfusions and platelet transfusions and uh, bone marrow biopsies, uh, lumbar punctures. Um, he also received chemotherapy at home and steroids um, every time he got chemotherapy. It's been a long process. Um, some people don't understand how long it is. It's over three years of treatment, so your life kind of gets turned upside down. Um, I don't get to work and I have to go to the hospital constantly. Um, we also had to drive back and forth all the time because we live in Monona. He's doing wonderful. Um, it took his body a little while to come back. I'd say probably six to eight months. Um, and now his counts are all normal. He's being a crazy little rambunctious seven-year-old, getting hurt in other ways. Um, but he's doing really good. I'm Dan Smith. Our son, Hunter, is diagnosed with uh, spinal muscular atrophy type 2. He was diagnosed at 11, between 10 and 11 months. Um, he wasn't rolling over, crawling, uh, acting as a normal 10-month-old baby when he was taken in and diagnosed. Hunter actually came into our life when he was seven and a half years old. We were asked to do foster care for Hunter and we didn't really know what we were getting into. It was really hard at first. He's been in and out of the hospitals with uh, pneumonias, uh, surgeries. Uh, he has growth rods in place. Uh, he has a G-tube in place. His stays have been anywhere from a week to three and a half weeks to, I mean, it's like twice a year, sometimes three times a year, but it seems like he's been getting better at it. Now we've kind of got it down to maybe twice a year, more so in the fall and the winter when it's colder. So he's doing really well, you know, compared to what he used to, was when he was smaller. And then we eventually adopted him in April of 2015. He's been just great. I mean, that we have our moments, you know, just like everybody else with their teenage kids. Um, but it's, it's been great, I have to admit. My name is Allison Dahl and my son is Keaton and he has chronic osteomyelitis of his left foot. Keaton's journey started when he was four and a half. Um, we just noticed that he constantly was complaining that his foot hurt, um, was limping, would sit out from playing with his cousins. We started taking him in to see podiatrists um, for a couple of years. They did insoles, they did uh, a whole bunch of different stuff, put him in a walking boot. Um, after that, the podiatrist wanted to put in a uh, arthresis screw because his foot kept um, rolling in and that's supposed to stop it. In the summer of 2017, I asked her, I said, so when is he not gonna complain that his foot constantly hurts? Um, his options were to stop doing the things that made it hurt, which were sports. Um, and if you know anything about Keaton, he loves sports. That's what he lives for. Um, and our other option was to do a surgery. We elected to do the surgery in December of 2017. In March of 2018, he played in a basketball tournament. Um, and for the first time ever, he said to us, my foot doesn't hurt. As a mom, that was probably the greatest thing because we knew we made the right choice. I don't know, maybe six months, nine months later, um, he started complaining that his foot was hurting again. We went in literally thinking 
we'll get some antibiotics, he'll be fine. Well, that wasn't the way it worked. It was one of the first times ever that I saw um, Keaton cry in pain. And I knew at that point that it really hurt. He's not a kid that cries. And to see him cry, it was just painful. I mean, it was hard. So we got him to the hospital. The, the doctor looked at him, um, said, yeah, he's got a major infection in his foot. We need to go in and clean it out. So as they discussed it, they decided that Keaton would go in for surgery. Um, and it wasn't just one day. He had to go in Monday and Tuesday because they wanted to make sure they got the infection out of his foot. And that's when they realized it was osteomyelitis and it was chronic as it had been in there for quite some time. They went and took the wound back off and as soon as the doctor took it off, she looked at me and said, the infections are back. Um, and this time it wasn't just the two original ones, he had two new ones. So he was battling four different infections in his foot. Well, I found out when you take infection out of your foot, you actually take parts of the foot with it. Anything that's infected, you basically cut it out and it's gone. And then it was the Friday, June 22nd that he went in for a reverse sural graft flap is what it was, procedure to close his, the hole in his foot. By November, they allowed him to play sports on a flat surface, so he went back to basketball. You know, getting to see him play the sports that he loves to do and do it without any pain was, was great. He had the attitude of just go with it. I mean, it is what it is. Like, this is my life right now. This is what I live with. Um, never complained, never said, you know, was never like, oh, this sucks. Why'd this happen to me? Like, just, you know, always upbeat and I was like, I was amazed by that. My name is Tessie Hurd. I have two boys this year that are heroes and they both have a diagnosis of Prader-Willi syndrome. So at 21 years old, I went in just to have my baby flipped and the doctor took one look at him and the doctor said that your baby is not looking too good. You have no amniotic fluid. He's probably not getting the nutrients he needs and we need to take him today. After just being in the room for like 10, 15 minutes with us, the NICU came down and they took him back and said that they needed to watch him because he had some different things that they had noticed. And I don't know, it never really sank in there that he was going to be different. The NICU doctor came in my room and that's when he broke the news to us that Mason was not going to be what we thought he was going to be. We had doctor after doctor after doctor, specialist after specialist after specialist come in and they were like, this is just different. We're not used to seeing this. We don't know what's going on. We just need to run more tests. We were in the NICU for 18 days and, you know, it was, it was a little stressful because, you know, financially I just started a new job. Um, you know, we were pretty young yet. A week after he was discharged, we had our first genetics appointment and she said, he has a diagnosis of something called Prader-Willi syndrome. And I bawled. <laughs> I thought this was the end of my life. I thought this isn't how life is supposed to be. Nobody's going to treat my baby the same way he deserves to be treated. And somebody, and then when we were in the NICU, I had this one nurse that was just, she told me like it, it was, and that's exactly what I needed. She said, you're going to have a different definition of normal, but it's going to be your normal and you will adjust to it. And I took that to heart. I was just like, you know what, maybe someday this will be normal, but I don't it's not gonna be normal anytime soon. And sure enough, we eventually got to a place where Mason's diagnosis was normal. We are dealing with a way, way bigger picture than just a child that is chronically hungry. And that is like my main goal in kind of trying to raise awareness for Prader-Willi syndrome is letting people know it's not just the fat kid syndrome as we've heard it referred to is Mason is so much more than being a chronically hungry little boy. He's so much more than his diagnosis. I was at work um, and Tessa texted me and said that she was on Facebook and she had seen a profile for a, a little boy who was 12 who had the same condition as our kid, Mason, and I was like, well, why not? I totally expected Grant to be like, 
are you kidding me? Like, we already have two little boys. We don't need to add a second with Prada Willie syndrome, a third boy. And Grant said, why don't you call his caseworker? So I called his caseworker and his caseworker was like, here's the deal, is Ethan has a diagnosis of something called Prada Willie syndrome. And I said, I have a son with Prada Willie syndrome. And I could hear it in her voice. She was like, we need to get this moving. It just clicked. Everybody clicked. Like he was good with our boys. Our boys basically called him brother right off the bat. In July of 2018, Ethan moved into our house. And in July of 2019, we were able to adopt Ethan. It's hard to imagine that if we wouldn't have had that diagnosis of prader willi syndrome back when Mason was born, and we wouldn't have had the journey we had with Mason, we wouldn't have had our Ethan. And to not have our Ethan, that's a sad, a sad thing to think about. But like with Mason and Ethan, they're chronically hungry. They have slower metabolisms, so they get overweight faster. And we have to, you know, follow a pretty strict diet. And it's like anytime you go out with family or at church activities or school, it's food is everywhere. And they're always zoned in on that. Like, and it gives them very high stress levels and anxiety about it. And I've found that these days, my tears come more from the strength that I see in my kids versus what we were dealing with and the diagnosis itself. My tears are not from the diagnosis, my tears are from how strong my kids are and how much inspiration they bring me. Sometimes families have financial issues before going into a medical diagnosis and then the big burden of having a medical diagnosis and getting to and from and just the logistics of it all, um, you know, CMN really helps and steps in to lessen that burden. It just takes a lot off of us knowing that CMN's there and that your money and what you've donated to CMN has greatly helped us and a lot of other families. All of a sudden, here's somebody, here's food, go get something to eat. Um, here's gas, get your kid to their appointment. Um, it, it was amazing. All these extras that you think you might need and you're worried about how you're gonna cover these things and how you're gonna get your kids to appointments, how you're gonna do all of that. And Children's Miracle Network is like, hey, we're here. You know, it's just, one of the better organizations you could donate your money to that stays right here locally, that helps so many different families. As I've learned, it doesn't pay for anybody's salaries. It goes straight back to the kids and the families that truly need it. You know, it feels like family when we come here between the doctors and the play ladies and um, even social workers and the resources that are available. It's just amazing and mind-blowing that people are willing to step up and help people in the most unfortunate times of their life. It helps us give our boys uh, a normal life, you know. Our hearts are just, just go out to these people and, and we really love them. It changed my life when I was going through a really, really hard time. You know, I can't do anything more than say thank you. My kid would not be in the same spot if it wasn't for CMN.